Uh, this talk is about a project that has been underway for two decades. I've called it my networks project. And it culminated recently in the book Connections and Content, subtitled Reflections on Networks in the History of Cartography, and published by Esri Press. The book explores the strong and enduring relationship between maps and networks, a relationship that has intensified over the last two centuries, and in particular since the late 1960s, when the topological database began to pervade mapping and map use. This convergence is the most recent phase in the use of network triangulation to integrate and extend measurements of angles and distances. And there's more. I've summarized the wider relationship by saying that behind every great map is a network, and behind every great network is a map. To clarify, what I mean by network is not the social networks of people trying to find employment or a soulmate. Um, the networks I have in mind are largely geometric or electronic, which is to say they include telecommunications links and some data structures, as well as the triangulation networks used for topographic mapping and geodetic control. GPS is included, as are most applications that use GPS. Also included are organizational structures of government and commercial endeavors that rely on a spatially distributed set of stations for the collection and dissemination of data or information. The most notable example is the U.S. National Weather Service. And so far as the network of Doppler radar stations known as NEXRAD played a fundamental role in the reorganization of the bureaucratic network of weather service offices. At one time, the map of weather stations was mostly a map of major cities and regionally important, not so major cities. In the 1990s, the reach of NEXRAD radar was used to define forecast areas more or less centered on a radar unit and its weather service forecast office. There were fewer of them, and they're all staffed 24-7. In this talk, I'm going to run through some key examples drawn from various chapters of, of the book and then focus on a specific sequence of phases, optics, wires, electronics, that provides a concise conceptual narrative. I make no claim that this sequence is inevitable. It's merely a convenient way to understand the evolutionary links, if you will, between physics and cartography. The first chapter is titled Baselines to underscore the importance of precise ground measurements of distance. Made at only one site or a small number of locations, these measurements can be propagated across a trigonometric network of optical measurements, thereby providing scale for topographic base maps and other derived mapping. This slide shows the Massachusetts baseline laid out conveniently along a straight stretch of not yet completed railway track. It's noticeably shorter than other links in the national network. This slide shows how the Massachusetts baseline fit into the much longer eastern oblique arc of geodetic triangulation, which ran from May to Louisiana. This arc eventually joined a larger network in which the arc of the 39th parallel extended westward into California. These arcs helped frame the United States Standard Datum, created in 1901. I titled my second chapter Geometry to characterize the use of angular measurements, astronomical observations, and precisely measured time differences to assign latitudes and longitudes the points on a planetary surface represented by a carefully calibrated ellipsoid, or so-called figure of the Earth. The network of telegraph stations was used to measure differences in time between star crossings. And these differences represented differences in longitude. Obviously, I'm glossing over lots of important but complex steps, including the use of multiple measurements to minimize error. Transatlantic cable provided a means for relating longitudes in North America to the system of longitudes used in Europe. Chapter 3, titled Symbols, looks at the graphic representation of networks exemplified here 
by a snippet from the U.S. Geological Survey's elaborate system of standardized symbols used to represent different types of network features. All of the book's illustrations are in black and white, which allowed me to use Photoshop to highlight particular symbols in situ, in this case to show how a temporal series of maps could represent the evolution of a network. The fourth chapter on infrastructure explores the use of maps in the planning and construction of canal, railway, highway, and electric power networks. I devote a fair amount of the chapter to the Erie Canal, which in its early stage of development served as the nation's first school of engineering. Understandable because there was no academic precedent for addressing the challenges of finding a water level route from the Hudson to the Great Lakes and for making it work. A major challenge was finding a way across the valley of Gurundicut Creek. Field mapping revealed a workable route across the top of a network of eskers, which are deposits left behind by streams flowing at the base of a continental glacier. To connect the eskers, the canal builders had to build a massive embankment. Maps were also useful in explaining a serious construction accident that occurred in converting the old Erie Canal into the wider New York State Barge Canal. Widening a waterway situated atop an esker is a tricky operation. Here's a more graphic view. If you want more, it's in the book. No one was killed, some farmland was flooded, lawsuits were filed, and work proceeded, albeit behind schedule. Chapter five focuses on telecommunications, which I discussed earlier in the context of atmospheric cartography and weather forecasting. But here is my own plot of the observation network of the Palatine Meteorological Society headquartered in Mannheim, and a reconstruction of the first weather map created about 33 years later by H.W. Brandes using data collected by the Palatine Observer Network using the postal network to send in their data and published in books. Curiously, the Palatine observers never thought to map their data. By contrast, Brandes, um, a professor of physics at the University of Breslau, thought he might learn something by mapping patterns of pressure and wind direction. His map was described in a journal article, but not otherwise preserved. Because of its historical importance, the author of a 1905 textbook reconstructed it using the printed Palatine data. Chapter six, titled A Topology, examines electronic representations of street and boundary networks used to aggregate counts for block level census data and to check for a dime file's internal consistency. Topological data sets support automated solutions to the shortest path problem, important in satellite navigation. Crowdsourcing and the so-called ant-based vehicle, vehicle congestion avoidance system, it's a mouthful, have introduced a dynamic element to GPS navigation. And positive train control, PTC, is a proactive strategy for controlling train movement. Its goal is the elimination of railway accidents resulting from a misaligned switches, excessive speed on curves, and head-on or rear-end impact. The final chapter on control includes the roles of networks and navigation in accident avoidance and situation awareness systems for autonomous vehicles and in the very different kind of control the topological data play uh, in partisan political redistricting in which algorithms for drawing election district boundaries can undermine a democracy by awarding a disproportionate number of seats to the political party that controls the process. Strategies for combating this include multi-member districts with ranked choice voting and increased transparency through publicly accessible online uh, mapping tools 
The hope is that public embarrassment through crowdsourcing, among other things, will deflect an outrageous power grab, or that state courts will intervene. Lots of luck with that. The federal judiciary has been reluctant to enter the so-called thicket of partisan gerrymandering. In looking for an overarching theme, I noticed a sequence of macro technologies that provide a concise and meaningful conceptual summary. Optics in this context is a matter of intersecting straight lines. That is, straight lines from an observer situated at one point to a target or bright object at another point. The first optical telescopes were used in the early 17th century. Improved optical telescopes allowed a target to be farther away or smaller or for an astronomical event to be more precisely timed. Joining a telescope to a pair of graduated circles, one horizontal and the other vertical, gave us the theodolite. You'll like this, John. Increasing the distance between stations was a matter of partly offsetting Earth curvature, terrain, and vegetation. The Bilby Tower, named for Jasper, Jasper Bilby of the U.S. Coast and Geodetic Survey, could be set up, taken down, and moved to another location. It was um, a set of two towers, an inner one to support the instrument and an outer one to support the observer. The tower illustrates the interdependence of instruments and infrastructure. This spring-wound chronometer shown here um, was used for precision estimates of time differences between star crossings at distant locations. Use of the telegraph network for determining differences in longitude was an improvement over a method called transportation of chronometers, whereby multiple timepieces were used in hopes that the errors would average out. Among the inventions essential for, the, for wired networks were improved batteries and relays able to transfer a signal from one wire to another, thereby defeating the electrical resistance inevitable with a single very long wire. There's a key distinction between electric and electronic. The early map directory shown here is more electric than electronic insofar as each button on the panel at the left simply opens a circuit to a meaningfully positioned light bulb on the map at the right. Of an important early development was the vacuum tube, which controls a gate of sort whereby a small current controls a much larger current. This kind of regulation or switching is important in the generation and reception of electromagnetic signals in a digital computation, of course. Note that progress depends on multiple inventions that can somehow be linked in an improved system. In a sense, the electronics phase involves two different geographic scales. At the macro scale, we have electromagnetic waves traveling from a GPS satellite to a ground station or from a radar antenna outward toward particles of precipitable moisture. At the micro scale, we have tiny currents moving through circuit boards and microchips. The electronics phase has taken over many of the measurement and operational roles of the optics and wire phases. For example, electronic distance measurement has replaced tedious exercises with steel tape and precision measuring bars. And the total station has replaced the theodolite. That said, the dissemination of cartographic knowledge and many other forms of knowledge relies on maps and networks of many types, electronic, bureaucratic, and intellectual. Thank you. <laughs>